Good afternoon. Oh, this is a faithful group. So we are so glad that you are here with us for this very last panel of this symposium. It's been an exciting symposium. Have you enjoyed it? Excellent, excellent. Well, this afternoon is the last panel. We decided what we wanted to do was have some fun with our topic. Our topic for this afternoon is innovative methodology. And as all of you know, Michigan has been just a hotbed of um, discovery in terms of various methodologies for doing cutting edge research. And what we wanted to do with this panel was put together a number of alum from uh, the university who are doing creative and cutting edge innovative research. And that's going to allow them to talk specifically about methodology. Not so much their findings, because they could do that too. These are very accomplished scholars and that they have been doing work that we think you'll find intriguing. So that's why we wanted to put this together and they wanted me to remind the audience that I told them that they were supposed to have fun with this presentation. So that's what we want to do. So what I'm going to do is just introduce, uh, basically by name and affiliation, all of our speakers for this afternoon. We have four. They're going to present, and then we'll have a panel dis discussion. We wanted to make sure that we were going to be leaving enough time so that we could interact and have a discussion around some of um, the questions you may have about the work that they're doing, because I think it's all very creative, and we are delighted they're with us. Our first speaker for today is going to be uh, Shinobu Kiriyama, and he is the Robert B. Zions Collegiate Professor of Psychology here at the University of Michigan. He's a graduate of the social psychology program here in psychology. I have to say that because at the time that we were here, I'm also a social psychologist um, from psychology. The sociology program also had a social psychology program. So we are the psychologist side of social psychology. I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Cleo Caldwell, and I'm the moderator for this particular panel. I'm a faculty over in the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education at the School of Public Health. Our second speaker is going to be Enrique, Enrique Neblet, Associate Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience. He's currently at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's a graduate of our clinical psychology program. So you can see some of the diversity that we have here on the panel. He'll be followed by Amy Schultz, and Amy is a professor in the Department of Health Behavior and Health um, Education at the School of Public Health, and Amy is um, a sociologist. So we wanted to have some diversity in the disciplines as well. And then finally we have with us Belinda Tucker, who is a professor of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences, University of California at Los Angeles. And Belinda was social psychology as well. So, see a little bias here, but <laughs> we're all interdisciplinary, which is another strength of the University of Michigan when we think about uh, the type of research that happens in the world. So we wanted to highlight the contributions um, of some of our innovative researchers in the social sciences who are graduates of the University of Michigan. And that's what this panel does. So please join me in welcoming all of them because they're going to flow through. And at the end of their presentations, we'll take your questions. How can I get my slide? Oh. oh, thank you. Uh, ah, yeah, that's it. Oh, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful uh, introduction. I'm very, very pleased uh, to be here. Uh, I've been here for quite a number of years. Uh, I initially, well, my degree uh, was from 1987 uh, here, uh, uh, and I had come from Japan, and I think I came here in 1982. Uh, when I came here, people were very nice. Uh, oh, Shinobu, welcome. Uh, you know, uh, which do you like, red or white? Uh, took me a while to figure out that they're talking about wine. Uh, and then second, I was just astonished that people didn't prepare 
the best wine for me from the very beginning. Well, I'm just, uh, this may sound a little bit strange because back in Japan, there was no, cho no practice like making a choice. And I didn't imagine that asking somebody to make a choice is a polite thing to do. So anyway, from the very beginning, I found this cultural difference very interesting. And in my own research since then, I have investigated how deep sociocultural practices, meanings, and maybe social structure can go under the skin. So that's the theme I'm going to elaborate on today. And in the recent, more recent years, I have investigated this by using neuroscience method, as well as biomarkers and so on. And today, I'd like to discuss some neuroscience of it. Now, I displayed this uh, notion, this word, phrase, cultural neuroscience, and that's a new field of research uh, that essentially is intended to address this, uh, this question, how is nature nurtured? That is, nature, in this case, brain or body might be nurtured. And uh, there are many different ways in which culture can influence the brain. Well, maybe you might imitate or you might mimic uh, others' behavior. You, you might conform. Obedience might be another way in which culture can influence your behavior. But in addition to all this, some form of reinforcement can be very, very significant. So once behaviors are, well, whatever you do, making a choice, not making a choice, conform to cultural norms, and then those behaviors may be reinforced. Now, this obvious notion seems to have very significant implications because once the behavior is reinforced, all the neural circuitries, neural connections recruited to produce this behavior may also be reinforced. And from the very beginning, people, individuals, engaging in the social environment in, in a variety of different ways, and the social environment provide feedback which can reinforce all the neural connections which are used. And this can be repeated, this will be repeated in, in finite uh, amount of time, resulting in potentially some significant effects on the brain and everything else. Now, in this work, we have focused on two prototypical cultural groups. Uh, one we call independent culture. Here, there are many tasks, such as making a choice, for example. But in addition to uh, self-promotion, self-actualization, freedom, achieving autonomy, those are some of the prototypical tasks which define this cultural context. Which, which is very different from where I was coming from, say, interdependent culture where self-sacrifice for the group, obligations and duties are very important and social harmony is an ultimate value. And as you might imagine, that the first kind of tasks are more, relatively more prevalent in, say, Western cultures, but the second ones are relatively more common in Asian cultures. Now, these cultures are extremely diverse, no question about this. But once you look into those prototypical tasks, which are existing in different cultural contexts, you may notice that there are some common themes or common things which are involved. So uh, in the case of independence, it's very important to manage one's own preferences, goals, attitudes, and so on, while monitoring what might make sense you know, for me to do. You know, essentially, what this means is that you are managing reward contingencies uh, to choose the best thing possible. Now, in curious way, interdependence involves something kind of opposite. Uh, you have to manage social expectations and normative requirements, so this often requires downregulating or inhibiting or suppressing or uh, deprioritizing uh, this uh, desires, preferences, and priorities. Now, what does this have anything to do with neuroscience? Well, there's one very interesting implication because Calculating reward contingencies, establishing personal preferences, making judgment and decisions by using values, preferences, and so on, those are pretty diverse set of tasks, but many of them 
are often linked to one particular brain region called orbital frontal cortex here, just above your eyes. Now, our work is motivated by this great insight uh, from this classic uh, uh, icon of neuropsychology, uh, Donald Hebb, uh, who essentially said neurons that fire together are wired together. That is, neurons are activated simultaneously. They tend to be connected. And this insight has recently been used to investigate neuroplasticity. Now, evidence is mounting that essentially if you engage in some specific set of tasks, say playing piano or playing go or chess or uh, driving a cab for 20 years in a complicated city like London without using one when a uh, modern navigation device <laughs> was not quite available. Those, are, those can result in significant effects on the cortical volume of specific areas of the brain. Now, apply this idea uh, to what I said about culture. Uh, well, you know, you might, uh, you might begin to see that if various neurons in OFC fire together, because those, tears, uh, those neurons are often involved in the cultural tasks prevalent in independent cultures, and then, well, those neurons may wire together. What does that mean? Well, given this neuroplasticity literature, you might expect that OFC may show some increase in gray matter volume over time. Now, conversely, if various neurons in OFC are prevented from firing, given the ways in which culture uh, works, and then uh, they may not wire. OFC may show a decrease in gray matter volume over time. Now, is that true? Well, in order to investigate this, uh, we, this is our initial study, just, just, it just come out. Uh, we scanned about 130, well, 135 Japanese. Uh, some are in college age, but uh, most of the subjects are real people uh, after college. And uh, we use this uh, method called VVM, kind of standard methods to investigate a major cortical uh, gray matter volume. And we administered a bunch of uh, questionnaires, including a scale of independent and interdependent self-control. So here, interdependence control is measured by items like my happiness depends on happiness of other people, for example. Okay, now what we did was to use this, these scales one at a time to see if those, this scale, say interdependence, might predict cortical volume of different areas of brain. Now, you might be surprised that you end up having many, many correlations if you carry out an analysis like this. However, our brain is a very complicated thing. There are so many neurons or voxels in uh, neuroimaging, and as a consequence, you really have to do very rigorous statistical uh, control. Once you do this, only a few areas survive this statistical assault. And one particular finding we got was this. Essentially, those two, well, this is this view of the brain. Essentially, you cut your brain here and look the brain up. So those two regions are orbital frontal cortex, right here, right above your eyeballs. And this region shows negative association with interdependent self-construal. What this means is that more interdependent folks have relatively smaller OFC. And this after controlling for total brain volume, age, gender, and in this case, uh, socioeconomic status, educational achievement. Now, out of this, you might expect that there might be some systematic cross-cultural difference. Um, oh, okay, five minutes. Uh, cross-cultural difference because we know that uh, Asian people are relatively more interdependent. It might, be, that might it be the case that OFC volume is less for Asians as compared to European Americans? 
Well, we did this, and as it turned out, if you do whole brain analysis, uh, there are many areas, several areas actually, which are clearly differentiate between European Americans and Asians, but one of those is OFC, orbitofrontal cortex. Um, here, OFC here, OFC here, here, and also here. So in order to investigate whether we might be able to replicate a previous finding, uh, we extracted this particular OFC region of interest and see if this might correlate with interdependent self-construal. And actually, this correlation was significant, and we replicated it. Now, from this, you can see that Asians are more interdependent and OFC is re relatively less. Now, really interesting question is whether this correlation might justify any causal inference. It's very hard. Uh, that is co I don't have to give you one hour lecture uh, to make this particular point. Now, how can you address this? Well, one way we addressed this uh, was this. Maybe we might be able to use genetics to address potential significance of environmental influences. Why is that? Well, actually, in the recent years, people have identified a set of alleles, genetic variants, which appears to support environmental influences. So for example, some alleles, some dopamine genes might increase the ability to learn some aspects of culture. And maybe if you can show this genetic moderation, it might be one way to make some inference about the impact of environmental influences. So one particular gene we have looked into is DRD4, because we know that some variants carriers Seven repeat, two repeat, there's no point in explaining this. Alleles associated with greater ability of learning are contrasted against non-carriers to see if the cortical volume difference in OFC might be more pronounced among carriers as compared to non-carriers. I hope you get the logic. Okay, so this is what we got. And very interesting. Essentially, we replicated cross-cultural difference in OFC volume, but this difference was significant only among carriers of this particular type of DRD4. Now, oh, I need to finish. One particular interesting finding, which I will keep it <laughs> to myself. Uh, however, I'll show you uh, the slides. Uh, is the effect of time among Asian-born Asians. We tested those agents in the United States, and they had spent varying amount of time in the United States, so if you look into the effect of time, uh, this may be another way of explore whether there might be some systematic effects of exposure to new culture on, on the cortical volume, and here's the data, and very simply, there's a very interesting initial evidence indicating that exposure to this new Western culture seemed to encourage growth of OFC, but this is true only among those people who are genetically predisposed uh, toward learning. All right, so let me conclude. Uh, so along with a whole bunch of things we and many other people have done in this area of research, it's very clear that culture is powerful. That's very important. And now effects of culture has been extended not only to functional aspects of brain, but also more structural aspects of the brain. And today I had no time to talk about disparity, discrimination, and so on, but I hope you see uh, the connection here. And finally, uh, one second, <laughs> why neuroscience? I, I hope uh, I illustrated the significance of neuroscience in social, neuros uh, social uh, and behavioral research. And there are many different ways to frame this, but one, I think really one take home message uh, about this issue is that essentially brain is a great storage 
of sociocultural experiences. And therefore, even though you may not be able to remember exactly what happened to you when you are in the first grade or even in preschool, it might be possible to look into the brain to investigate the trace of sociocultural influences, and that's where real value of neuroscience seems to lie. So, thank you very much. There will be time during the question and answers to get more information, because I'm interested in that link with discrimination, um, from all of our speakers. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, everyone sounds sleepy or something. <laughs> Hopefully I can uh, wake you up a little bit. Um, I am honored to be here this afternoon. And um, to start us off, Cleo told us we had to have fun with this. Um, I was, went through the archives of my uh, photo pictures and came up um, with this picture. Uh, from 2006. This is at my defense. So um, on, it was a Wednesday, February 15th, 2006, um, I underwent one of the toughest um, and challenging um, intellectual experiences um, of my graduate career. Um, I was seated across the table from some of Michigan's greatest minds, some of whom are in the audience, uh, Liz Cole, Laura Conewood, Robert Sellers, uh, David Williams, Woody Neighbors, um, so on and so forth. Um, fortunately, things turned out well, um, although I can still um, channel the modicum um, of embarrassment I felt uh, when after the defense, my mom uh, went up to David Williams and said, wow, you sure asked some tough questions. <laughs> uh, my dissertation was entitled uh, Racial Identity and Coping in Context. Um, I was interested in the protective function of racial identity, so how could the significance and meaning uh, of race to individuals um, act as a protective factor in the context of discrimination. Um, and I was really intrigued by this idea that the centrality or the importance of race to one's self-concept um, could mitigate or counteract um, the deleterious impact of discrimination. So um, in the dissertation, I was interested in looking at um, how different aspects of identity would relate to coping um, and really thinking about um, individual differences, what are the situational factors and other individual factors that influence how black youth uh, cope with racism. About three weeks after this picture was taken, um, I received word that um, I would be a recipient of a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellowship, uh, and I would have the opportunity to study uh, with Dr. Jules Harrell at Howard University um, who is one of the foremost thinkers on uh, racism and stress. Um, and the exciting thing about um, studying with Jules um, is that he is also a psychophysiologist. I had been increasingly reading um, the racial disparities literature with interest, um, and I was intrigued by this fact that African Americans, when you looked at life expectancy, disease morbidity, all these things were at the bottom, and I wanted to understand why that was. Studying with Jules would be a perfect opportunity to kind of connect the uh, sort of psychological processes um, with the biology um, to understand a little bit more about how exactly racism um, leads to poor health outcomes. Um, and then a more specific question I was interested in was whether or not racial identity and some of the other protective factors that I had studied as a graduate student, so things like racial socialization, things like Afrocentric worldview, would act as a protective factor um, in the same way for biological outcomes as they might for, uh, uh, for, for psychological and physiological factors. So off I went to Howard and um, <laughs> spent uh, two years there. Um, and during that time, um, thought about how we could do this effectively. A, a lot of it was actually figuring out the experimental methodology um, and less about actual um, uh, uh, findings. But um, one of the challenges of um, studying individual differences and in responses to racism is that it presents a number of unique challenges um, in <laughs> for the experimental methodologists and for the psychophysiologists. How do you study um, racism in a laboratory context? Okay. 
Fortunately, uh, there had been some work um, done in this area by Jules and others, um, and he trained me up um, in something we call the visual imagery um, paradigm. So the visual imagery paradigm is a paradigm in which you have participants come into the lab um, and imagine instances of racism as if um, the individuals are actually experiencing uh, the racism themselves. Um, there's evidence to suggest that these analogs are similar to the actual experience um, of racism. At least that's what the literature argued. And so we had folks come into the lab um, and listen to these different vignettes uh, and we measured their uh, physiological responses as they imagined and processed um, these events. So, to give you some idea uh, of what a participant might hear, uh, here's one scenario. You are driving along a suburban street when a car like yours screeches past you at high speed. Then you see a police car behind you with its red lights flashing. To your surprise, the white policeman pulls you over and begins to berate you for speeding. You feel your heart pounding in your chest as you realize his mistake. Muscles tensing, you try to explain, but he cuts you off saying you N-word are all the same. And in the vignette, we didn't say N-word, we actually used the racial slur. While struggling to control your temper, you sit fuming to yourself while the policeman writes the ticket. And we would say, start imagining the scene from the beginning of the description, okay? Um, there was a lot of discussion around racism becoming uh, more subtle. It wasn't new, but we talked about it. And so we varied the uh, blatant versus subtle nature of the racism. Uh, we also borrowed some language from Rodney Clark's work on um, intragroup racism and varied the race of the perpetrator. So sometimes the officer was black, sometimes it was white. Um, in a subtle uh, instance, or the subtle condition, I won't read the entire script here, uh, but we had a scenario where an individual is standing in line, they're next in line to receive service, uh, and the um, cashier calls the next person in line, um, things of that nature. So something a little more subtle, where race was not um, invoked as directly um, as in the racial epithet scenario. What participants would do is they would come into the lab and we would outfit them with electrodes. Uh, my training at Howard was particularly in the area of cardiovascular psychophysiology. And this was exciting because when I looked at the racial health disparities literature, a lot of it was talking about um, poor disease outcomes in terms of um, cardiovascular disease um, related diseases. And so I thought, wow, if I want to study psychophys, this is, uh, uh, this is what I want to look at, uh, cardiovascular psychophys. So the participant, ah, okay. The participant would uh, sit quietly for one minute, 60 seconds, and then um, listen to the scenario, like the one I've just read. Um, after hearing the scenario, um, the participant would be asked to imagine the scene, um, to concentrate on imagining the scene for 60 seconds. Um, and then the participant would be asked to stop imagining the scene, open your eyes, and concentrate on relaxing. And they would sit for another 60 seconds um, before they would um, move on to the next thing, okay? And we measured, in addition to their physiological responses, um, their affective, emotional responses, we assessed their mood after each scenario, they listened to six of these, um, so on and so forth. Okay, so, so that was the design. Um, as I mentioned, the design was not um, completely new. A visual imagery had been used before, but the innovation here was that we were not using self-report measures. Um, we were also using cardiovascular psychophys measures that had not previously been used before. So the field had focused primarily on heart rate, um, it had focused on blood pressure. One of the things we know about those measures is that you cannot isolate the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, which were some of the very systems that were implicated in understanding how racism leads to uh, cardiovascular uh, problems. And so this was an opportunity to see, would we really see specific impact on the, cardi on the sympathetic nervous system, flight or fight, um, so on and so forth, okay? 
The other innovation here was that we were measuring uh, racial identity, we were measuring uh, you know, racial socialization and a number of cultural resilience factors. One of the things I've been interested in in my work is not just the relationship between racism and health. I think we have a, bit, a pretty good idea of what <laughs> the news is there. But are there cultural resilience factors that might allow um, youth to um, sort of uh, be more uh, resilient in the context of racism? And can we incorporate these uh, resilience factors into um, the interventions um, at multiple levels? Okay, so that was uh, what the, the added piece was with the work that we did. Okay. Um, Cleo has asked us not to spend a lot of time talking about findings, so I'm just going to highlight one finding um, that I've been grappling with um, in the work that we've done at Carolina. So, um, as I mentioned, a lot of the visual imagery paradigm work at Howard was more about <laughs> figuring out how you set this up and designing the scenarios. Um, it wasn't until Carolina um, that I set up my lab and really um, got some of this other work going. Um, and here is the interesting finding. So. Racial identity, I gotta stay by the mic, protective factor um, in the context of mental health outcomes. When we use this paradigm, um, what we saw is that when we looked at emotional and affective responses, it was the individuals who said being black is really important to, I, to who I am, who reported more anger, they reported more distress, uh, when they filled out a measure shortly after um, completing, um, imagining this scenario. This is not what I expected. We expected that if racial uh, centrality is protective, that they would be less bothered by these events. But that's not what was happening. They were reporting higher levels of um, disgust um, and, and really across the board, um, negative affect, okay? So that's what this shows here. I'm not gonna focus on details. Um, in the psychophysiological realm, what was interesting is that when we isolated the sympathetic nervous system, the flight or fight response, um, and it takes a while before you get there. If you, you know, psychophysiologists sort of talk about the parasympathetic, usually when stress occurs, the parasympathetic nervous system orients and tries to figure out what's going on. Before you see sympathetic activation, or when you see sympathetic activation, it means that, um, <laughs> The body's really saying there's trouble here, okay? And what we found was that individuals who were more race central, who said being black is important to who I am, they were the ones, they're on the right in both of these, when they imagined scenes with the white actors, it didn't matter if it was subtle, if it were blatant, if it were just a control condition where we said there's some white folks in the area the people who had higher racial centrality showed an exhibited sympathetic nervous system response, okay? So this was again interesting. When we looked at sort of the um, emotional responses, they're reporting more negative affect. Uh, one of the beauties of the physiology is that you can't control, the, well, uh, you know, there are ways to move towards controlling it, but you know, it's less subject to control we saw elevated um, sympathetic nervous system responses, okay? One finding which I won't detail here because it didn't come out of this paradigm, over the last several years, we've been collecting um, longitudinal data um, in North Carolina, and what we find is that in young adults, individuals who have higher levels of centrality, higher levels of private regard, over time, racial discrimination experiences are associated with higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of uh, uh, psychological distress, so on and so forth, okay? This body of work has really kind of rocked my world a little bit because as a graduate student, racial identity was a protective factor. Um, it was supposed to buffer the effects of racism. And now we began to add a little bit more complexity to it. So. Um, folks reporting feeling more distressed and angry. Could it be that that served a protective function? Um, could it also be that, um, you know, there were reasons, maybe the context mattered in terms of, um, there's a lot of stuff going on in North Carolina, in terms of why um, folks who are more race central might be reporting increased psychological distress. 
So in terms of some of the future directions um, that we're thinking about in this work, really trying to unpack the mechanisms. Uh, one of the things that's um, striking to me um, in rereading and reading this literature is that there are so many different mechanisms by which racism um, might impact health. Um, we heard about some of them earlier today. Um, some of them have been tested, some not, but really, I'm really interested in kind of underscoring what's going on. And that's because if you want to dismantle racism, you have to understand um, how it works. And so if we have empirical evidence about the mechanisms, I think that serves that cause. If you want to design interventions, as I do, and culturally informed interventions that inform some of these uh, race socialization and identity pieces, um, you've got to understand the mechanisms by which that works. And so that's some of the work that uh, we've been doing um, as well. Um, time is short here, so um, I'll just comment quickly um, some additional innovation that's come from some of my former students uh, and current students is looking at vicarious racism. What is the impact of exposure to seeing over and over shootings? So the, the constant media attention um, online or through whatever medium um, and thinking about um, how that may play a role. And my students said, we like your, you know, your visual imagery paradigm is nice, but um, Dr. Neblet, we really need to um, actually have live experiences of racism in the lab. And so this is a paradigm here where we use Confederate social psychology paradigm um, and actually have um, someone bump um, the white Confederate um, on his way out. The black Confederate does this. The participant who's African American is sitting in the back. Um, the white Confederate whips out uh, his phone and makes um, a number of derogatory comments um, about the black individual who um, uh, just bumped them, okay? Um, another example of innovation, um, we have a uh, uh, Lori Hoggard, she's now at Rutgers University, um, who looks at um, whether people eat cookies in the lab. So there are lots of chips ahoys in the lab, and, uh, or there used to be. Um, and she would look at when people were accused of stealing an iPad, um, whether they would eat more cookies um, and, uh, and whether eating sugary um, you know, things might play a role in um, health outcomes. So this gives you an idea of some of the things that have come from the, the body of work. Okay, um, I am over time, so if you want to hear about um, this image here, feel free to ask about it uh, in the... <laughs> okay. And then this is my last image here. Um, we are doing um, many interesting things in the world of innovation. So we're using photo voice, experimental psychophysiology. We use CBPR um, in our methods. Um, but one of the exciting things about um, being a Michigan product is just the students I've been able to train who are, you know, law school students, faculty now, postdocs, and who are doing some of this innovative um, research. Um, I am extremely grateful um, to Michigan um, for equipping me with the skills to do um, good work, um, but also for the, the people that I had the opportunity to work with here who um, pushed me to be excellent, who believed in me, um, and who just helped me, people like Rob Sellers, to um, train students um, and, and give back. So um, as I close, I just want to extend my thanks um, to my alma mater, University of Michigan, um, for allowing me to be in a community of scholars um, that has really pushed my work forward um, and has really surrounded me with um, lifelong family and friends who are truly leaders and best. Thank you very much. Uh, is my mic on? Am I good here? A little closer. A little closer? Okay, thanks. Um, 
Well, welcome everybody. I, um, I also want to extend my gratitude to um, Cleo and to the others who invited me to participate in this um, conference. I feel really fortunate to be able to share um, some of the work that we've been doing and to talk about community-based participatory research, which is my um, innovative methodology that I'm going to be talking about. Um, I am, I think, the, the token sociologist up here, um, and, I, uh, <laughs> and um, when I was a student in, in sociology, one of the things that I became very interested in was the social construction of knowledge and how we go about, um, as, as, as human beings, as individuals, and as societies, thinking about how do we produce knowledge. Um, and as part of that, I was interested in inequalities, in who has access to or the opportunities to engage in the production of knowledge. And that led me down a path to really thinking about how do we collectively engage who has voice, who has opportunities, um, and whose knowledge does uh, get produced and gets out there. Um, that really led me to thinking about community-based participatory research, um, which is a, an approach to research. It's not really a methodology. It's an approach to doing research that focuses on how do we engage multiple perspectives, multiple voices, um, including those who often don't have opportunities to engage in the social production of knowledge? I'm starting my talk with a, a picture. Some of you may recognize this. This is the Ambassador Bridge, which is the um, busiest border crossing between the U.S. and Canada. Um, this bridge goes between Detroit and Windsor and carries about 15,000 diesel trucks um, on it, across it, um, every day. I'm going to come back to this image um, in a little bit. But first, I'm going to take us to another, another river and another border. Um, this is um, the border, also on the border between the United States and Canada. This is the St. Lawrence River Valley. Um, it travels between upstate New York and Ontario. Um, and it's an area that has a rich history of use by indigenous people in North America um, going back about 9,000 years. It's an area with abundant um, plant, wildlife, uh, fish, um, very fertile soils, so it's a very good area for gardening. Um, and um, it, it contributed to settlements um, with extensive gardens and trade networks that reached far north, far south, as far west as uh, the, the western shore of Lake uh, Superior um, for, um, for centuries. Um, beginning about in the mid-1700s, thereabouts, um, uh, the community that now is known as the Mohawk community came and settled in this area, um, in an area called the Akwesasne um, community, um, along the St. Lawrence River Valley. And they continue to live there to this day. Oops, what did I do? There. So this map shows uh, the St. Lawrence River, St. Lawrence um, Seaway, and the area that shows in pink on this map is now what's called uh, the Akwesasne Nation or the Mohawk Nation. It's a tribal community located between, it spans the U.S. and Canada. Um, beginning in the 1950s, inexpensive hydroelectric power generated um, by the St. Lawrence River attracted a number of industries to the area um, upstream of the Akwesasne Nation. You can see some of those shown in this map. I hope you can see these. Um, the, General, the General Motors Powertrain Division is located immediately adjacent to the Akwesasne Nation. Um, and it is downstream, downwind, and down gradient. So everything's traveling um, towards the Mohawk community from the R.J. Reynolds um, Metals and the Aluminum Company of America, or Alcoa, all of which are Superfund sites currently. Toxicants from these sites have contaminated the soil, the air, and the water of the Akwesasne Nation to the extent that public health professionals have issued advisories saying that no women of childbearing age should eat any fish that are caught um, from the, the St. Lawrence River, um, and nor should infants or young children. Um, the, and, and the, the the tribal community has pretty much come, they've, they've internalized those messages, they have pretty much um, complied with those messages to a very strong extent. This is um, good news in the public health community where our mantra often is um, no exposure, no adverse effects. People are not ingesting these toxic chemicals and therefore there is no 
um, adverse effect. However, I want to read an excerpt from a very um, beautiful paper that writ was written a number of years ago by, by Mary Arquette, who is a public health professional and an enrolled member of the Akwesasne Nation. She and her colleagues point out that in Akwesasne, as in many other communities, potentially serious adverse health effects can result when people stop traditional cultural practices in order to protect their health from the effects of toxic substances. When traditional foods such as fish are no longer eaten, alternative diets are often consumed, which are often high in fat and calories and low in vitamins and nutrients. This type of dietary change has been linked with many health outcomes, such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, cancer, and obesity. Consequently, serious health problems can result as when, as in the case of Akwesasne, traditional foods are no longer consumed, even if there is no, no a little or, or no exposure to toxic substances. So here we have an alternative perspective, um, an alternative way of thinking about this shift in the diet um, that may have protected people from toxic exposures, but may have opened the door to other health issues. Furthermore, many of you may be familiar with the history of the Indian boarding schools um, in which um, young people from tribal communities were brought to boarding schools and kept there often many times for years um, when, with the goal of complete assimilation away from tribal communities and into white, um, white communities. This is a photo. These, these types of before and after photos are very common from the, the boarding school era, era. They clearly symbolize something very important um, to the boarding school and the white communities that funded these. Um, and this young man um, it was Navajo, not, not um, Akwesasne. Um, but this is a picture of his before and after um, coming to the um, Carlisle Indian School. Within this historical context, a recommendation to stop traditional hunting and gathering um, practices, which are deeply embedded with cultural, spiritual, um, and social significance within tribal communities, can also be experienced as a continuation of assimilation, or what's often called in indigenous communities, cultural genocide. Okay? Um, thus, our scientifically informed advisories and actions grounded in the best of our Western science and the often usually the best of intentions to protect people from exposures to toxins can have unintended consequences that can lead them to be in the best case um, scenario less effective than they might be and in the worst case scenario to actually harm communities often in un unintended ways and Tuskegee is probably the most notorious example of, of this. So community-based participatory research is an approach to conducting research that emerged out of this understanding that when we create knowledge in, in um, academic communities, we often may be creating a knowledge that's partial, that's incomplete, um, and that does not take advantage of the rich resources and knowledge and, and, um, and experiences of communities who are, do not have opportunities to sit in these um, places that we get to sit in every day and think um, and, and, um, and create, create knowledge. It recognizes that both researchers and community members stand to make critical contributions to an understanding of complex phenomenon and that working by working together in an equitable manner that recognizes and values contributions from multiple perspectives and lived experiences, we can create a more complete and nuanced understanding of a given phenomenon and can position ourselves with the potential to create more complete solutions um, to those issues. So now we're back to our bridge um, over, uh, over the Detroit River. I want to share very quickly an example um, from a community-based participatory research effort in which I've had the privilege to have worked over the last several years. So it's called Community Action to Promote Healthy Environments or CAFE. CAFE has two main overarching goals, and these came from, were named by residents of Detroit who have been grappling with these issues for a very long time. Our goals are to develop a multi-level integrated and scientifically informed, sounds 
cool, doesn't it? Public Health Action Plan um, to reduce the adverse effects of air pollution um, on the health of Detroit residents and to promote the implementation of that plan. CAFE is made up of a number of community-based organizations and academic researchers based at the um, School of Public Health. Very briefly, historically, um, Detroit has faced challenges, multiple challenges with air quality. Um, there are multiple pollutant sources from the history, um, uh, the industrial history of the area, um, as well as the contemporary um, bridge, which brings in volumes of tra traffic, diesel traffic, which is particularly harmful to health, into heavily populated areas. So there are large exposed populations within the city of Detroit. There are disproportionate levels of adverse health outcomes, including, to name a few, um, uh, excess uh, risk of, of asthma, cardiovascular disease, and adverse birth outcomes, all of which are linked to air, air pollutants. Because of the proximity of, man, of manufacturing um, to neighborhoods in Detroit, there are large numbers of residents of vulnerable um, communities that are disproportionately um, exposed and affected. This shows a playground, this photo shows a playground that is uh, in the people's, uh, it, it's adjacent to People's Community Services, which is a community um, organization in Detroit, and right behind it, um, you can see the water treatment facility um, in Detroit. You can get a sense of how proximate, how close some of these manufacturing sources are to where children are playing, um, and the, the kinds of exposures that might come um, from that. So our goal was to bring scientific evidence to bear to create a set of recommendations to reduce some of these exposures and to um, try to get some of that work done. One of the things that we did um, as part of this process was to map um, where there are high levels of exposure. This map shows um, with uh, uh, the, air, the levels of um, diesel pollutants um, in the, in the tri-county area, so Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb County. Um, and what this shows, the yellow areas are the areas with the lowest level of exposure and increasingly dark red areas with the highest level of exposures in the, um, in the red areas. The next slide I'm going to show you um, shows how this maps onto um, uh, community characteristics. So here, um, what we're seeing is um, communities, uh, census tracts rank ordered um, by the levels of poverty, um, the proportion of people of color, the pr proportion of children under the age of five who are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of air pollutants, and the proportion um, people over 60 who, again, are, are um, particularly vulnerable. And you can see that there's a fair amount of inequality in the, distribu in the distribution of risk with communities that are more vulnerable being more highly um, uh, um, uh, exposed. We also quantified some of the adverse health effects. This slide shows the number of deaths, the number of hospitalizations, the number of missed school and work days that are attributable to air pollutants, and tries to put a number on the annual cost associated um, with air pollution in the, in the tri-county area. Based on this, we came up with a set of recommendations. Here are strategies we can use to reduce air pollution. We also looked at where are we going to have the biggest impact on the most vulnerable populations and incorporated that into our recommendations. We took the recommendations to the community, talked to community residents um, about them, included, um, engaged them in a conversation about them, and they, their recommendations and ideas were included in our final set and in our final public health action plan. You guys can ask me about this one during the break. Um, it's one of the very nice things that's happened as a result of the work. I want to speak just really quickly before I close um, about community-engaged research and its relevance to some of our core values here at the University of Michigan. First, it's an approach to conducting research, which of course we value very highly at this institution. It actively engages multiple perspectives, insights, and knowledge in a process that stands to, to create a more robust and complete understanding of a given phenomenon by bringing those very rich and varied insights to understanding it. Second, it offers opportunities to build relationships with communities who we care deeply about, 
um, here at the University of Michigan. I work with community partners um, who, with whom I have worked at this point for almost 20 years. Um, and um, together, we have opportunities to create knowledge that we might not otherwise be able to. I also want to just point out that CBPR is consistent with the university's deep commitment to diversity and equity um, in our work. The engagement of multiple perspectives, multiple insights, multiple epistemologies, um, and multiple lived experiences in the process of co-creating knowledge is something that is central to our mission as a university. And it pushes us to think a little bit harder about the I in our DEI initiatives. We often talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it seems to me that if we truly want to, uh, to achieve diversity and equity in this institution, we need to push beyond inclusion and really think about institutional transformation in a manner that um, can effectively engage the multiplicity of knowledges and epistemologies that are out there that can help us really build a robust um, body of knowledge. And I am also over time, I apologize, Cleo, I want to thank everybody again for hanging in there um, to the last session of the day. I want to thank the organizers, and most especially I want to thank my colleagues um, in Detroit and here at the University of Michigan who have made this work possible. So. Oops. Pressure on me, huh? Okay. <laughs> and this is how we change them. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and everybody gets a gold star for staying through the very end. I'm not saying bitter end, the wonderful, glorious end. <laughs> I want to thank Cleo, of course, and certainly I want to thank the organizers of this incredibly um, enriching gathering, uh, Susan Collins and, and, and David Lamb. Uh, I am truly honored to be here. When I entered, and I don't know if I'm close enough, okay. When I entered uh, the University of Michigan as a, a graduate student in the early <clears throat> 1970s, okay, I admit it, the discipline of psychology and the social sciences more generally were in a very different kind of place and a, and a challenging place, particularly with respect to the, the study of populations of color and of others uh, here of these last couple of days have, have, have also noted, we've, we've come a long way. Uh, my entry actually coincided with the hiring of the first ever African-American psychology professor. Um, and James Jackson, who like the black students of that period, had spent uh, many of his formative years uh, immersed in the civil rights movement. Uh, indeed, I had the, the privilege of participating in uh, a real celebration of Jackson's transformative contributions, uh, marked, of course, by his receipt of the University of Michigan's Distinguished Diversity Scholar Career Award, which from now on is going to carry his name. In fact, I stood in this very place last week, also the very last person on that symposium, so I guess that's my job from now on. Uh, the dismal state of psychology in the 1970s, I think, was well captured by Bob Guthrie's uh, brilliantly titled work, uh, Even the Rat Was White, which also referred to the fact that they were using white rats in experiments, but also uh, middle class and upper middle class white sophomores uh, to do the basic experiments in psychology. And unfortunately, the, uh, the people doing the research are also pretty homogeneous. So in many studies at the time, African Americans in particular, but certainly also other ethnic and racial groups were often compared unfavorably with whites, with uh, differences typically explained by some version of, of def deficit modeling. Oops. 
But what soon followed right here at the University of Michigan in the Institute for Social Research was what I conceive of as a, a revolution, uh, a revolution of thought, a revolution of contact, of conduct that really has what I view as a profound impact on the study of populations of color today and the way we carry out survey research today. Uh, it's also created a large and truly engaged cadre of social scientists uh, that I firmly believe would never have existed without the program that I'm, I'm going to describe. Now, is this the one? Is this what I use? Yeah, there we go. So I'm talking about the survey of African Americans, of black Americans, as it was called then, that was conducted between 1978 and 1980. And I'm going to talk about how that one research project launched a, a revolutionary transformation of social science research addressing ethnic populations and the, the scientific workforce. So I'm going to take you through a historical journey, I hope a brief one, uh, and I have to call it a, a love letter, really. Um, to the people I worked with, the people who have become my lifelong friends, uh, that outlines the impact of that one study. And, in David's uh, terms, it is good news. It's, it's all good news. Um, that journey began for me with my fortuitous enrollment in the University of Michigan and subsequent encounters I had with uh, James Jackson, uh, Pat and Jerry Gurin, uh, Libby Duvon, Frank Yates, and a set of truly exceptional fellow students, some are here today, who became lifelong collaborators, collaborators and, and best friends, including Phil Bowman, Woody Neighbors, Linda Chatters, Robert Taylor, Shirley Hatchett, Letha Chidea. So the Civil Rights Movement, as I mentioned before, really was a prologue for what happened. When James was hired in psychology, um, he was a young man in his mere 20s, and most of us were barely out of adolescence. Uh, but revolutionary fervor was high then. Most of us had engaged in various forms of social protest during those years, during our college years. Um, we were quite accustomed to pointing out injustices, uh, to pointing out biases, prejudices, racism, injustices. And James had been struck by the impact of one very classic study, uh, Americans View Their Mental Health, which had um, told us a lot about factors affecting well-being in the general population. Jerry Gurin had actually been one of the co-PIs on that project. So James approached Jerry about doing the same thing for black people. Uh, with uh, a nationally represented, serve representative, um, pop I'm sorry, a nationally representative sample of African Americans. And although I was just a, a freshly minted uh, doctor, doctorate myself, a PhD in social psychology in psychology, um, they asked me to be a co-PI on that initial grant, which was actually funded eventually by uh, the National Institute of Mental Health. Now, what is revolution? One definition is that it's a sudden, vast change in a situation, a discipline, or the way of thinking or behaving. And I think that's really what happened at that point in time. So what was so revolutionary about this one study? Certainly, it's focus on African Americans in and of themselves. And it's probably going to be difficult for many of you in this audience to believe, but at that time, you could not do a project on a survey, certainly, on African Americans uh, without what they called a white control group. And I can remember well when James was presenting to the scientists at, uh, at ISR in a big forum on the sixth floor uh, what his ideas were, they pushed back. I said, how on earth can you do a study without a white control group? The implication for us was that black people and Latinos and Asians and Native Americans and so on only mattered in relationship to whites. So the study broke a fundamental convention in social sciences research. It's also the first national representative probability sample of African Americans. We were proposing to do something that had never been done. We were seeking information on all kinds of African Americans in the United States, living in every kind of circumstance. And in so doing, we were declaring that African Americans really weren't this single monolithic group that was implied in many of the studies that have been done in the day. They could be urban 
or rural. They could be rich or poor. They could live in Iowa or Georgia, in black or white neighborhoods, and so on. So this rich tapestry was, in fact, the black experience, which had not really been recognized until that point. The study was fundamentally multi and interdisciplinary. That is, it was based on the assumption that was rare at that time that no single disciplinary lens was sufficient to understand mental health or, or even human behavior more generally. So this project that was led by a social psychologist also incorporated many other areas of psychology, including de developmental and personality, but also economists, sociologists, political scientists, psychiatrists and other physicians, anthropologists, political scientists, and public health specialists, anybody who could inform our models. And notwithstanding Michigan's uh, eventual embrace of interdisciplinarity, it really was pretty rare at that point in time. We also challenged what at the time was the methodological orthodoxy. Uh, we deviated from standard operating procedure in, in a number of ways in order to minimize the impact of race on the interview itself, but also to interrogate the meaningfulness of the constructs that we were using. We really could not be sure that any of the standard measures that were typically used in social surveys were relevant for the African-American populations that, that we were examining. So in addition to using only African-American interviewers from the, gym, from the geographic regions where people came from, so you didn't have uh, somebody in the South being interviewed by somebody with a Northern uh, accent, um, we employed several other very specific strategies. And I'm actually going, not going to describe those in detail because I'm running out of time. Um, but that included uh, interview of respondent uh, matching, obviously, but something called the Brandon Probe uh, that Howard Schumann, who had been a legendary ISR scientist, had come up with, a technique to develop the respondent's shared understanding of a construct, uh, back translation, a linguistic tool that um, we used to um, to, to figure out whether or not the respondent truly understood what we were asking, uh, converging operations, using several different methods to, to, to understand the meaning of a construct. Now, I'm going to describe in a bit more detail uh, one final methodological strategy that had more to do with efficiency and, and cost effectiveness. And some of you already know about this, but it was critical in terms of ensuring a truly representative national sample, which I must emphasize again had not been done before. So James Jackson had a dream one night, and those of you who know this story know it well, and it concerned our sampling strategy. Uh, how do we get that rare sample of blacks, the people who live in white neighborhoods? Uh, typically when a study oversampled blacks, they get blacks who lived in black neighborhoods because that was easy and that was cheap. So, James suddenly realized that if you just went to these white neighborhoods and asked where the black people lived, you could probably find out with a fair degree of certainty where they were. And in fact, this was proven to be the case. All you had to do was go to those neighborhoods and they'd point out where the black people lived. It turned out to be a foolproof method and he named it the Wide Area Sampling Procedure, WASP. It's now used internationally, actually, to screen for rare samples of all sorts. Finally, and this is the most important point, I think, especially in terms of, of the meeting we're having today, that this program really was a vehicle for generating a new cadre of social scientists. So just as critical and innovative as our methodological advances were, was the stated goal of using the survey as a vehicle to train ethnic minority students and postdoctoral scholars in the fine art of survey research as had been rebranded by this project. Graduate students were involved in absolutely every part of that project, including proposal writing, research, design, questionnaire development, sampling, interviewer training, uh, coding, data analysis, write-up. Eventually, training programs became an integral part of that program. And it's a measure of that, of the, and it is on this measure, I think, that the program was successful beyond anyone's wildest dreams. And I have to remind people, we did this before the internet, before computers. 
So we'd stay all, all night typing drafts. I know few of you can even imagine this. So the NSBA actually inspired a host of, of other studies. Uh, the NSBA itself became a, a panel study with re-interviews at 8, 9, and 12 years, creating not just the first national um, and re representative survey of black Americans, but also the only four-wave study. Um, the National Chicano Survey. Oh, and I forgot the national election studies, of course, that, that had, had been done. The Chicano National Survey, done by um, Carlos Arce and Pat Gurin, uh, also inspired the, the National Chicano Research Network, the National Black Election Study, which I just mentioned, buoyed by the success of the NSBA, of course, and inspired by Jesse Jackson's uh, run for presidency. Four panels of that study were also done. And of course, the National Survey of American Life, which many of you know about, but also added an adolescent sample and for the first time allowed researchers to tease out the impact of race and ethnicity by incorporating a Caribbean ancestry study as well as another white study. Now importantly, a parallel study was also launched by my good friends uh, Maggie Alegria and David Takauchi. Um, and this study allowed for the first time the same kind of investigation to take place within Asian American populations and in Latino populations. But it doesn't stop just there because it also infused some of our training activities. The Family Research Consortium was a five year, um, a repeated five year training project that brought family researchers together every summer for an institute. We'd have 100 or 200 people. Uh, and it also had a postdoctoral program. Uh, David Takeuchi, again, these names keep coming back. I wish I could do a network analysis of everybody who had been associated with this project, but David Takeuchi and uh, um, Andrew Fellini were my co-principal investigators on that project. We brought together people who were already professionals, uh, faculty members, researchers, physicians, who wanted to learn more about survey research, and we trained them in the use of these data samples. Um, we heard yesterday about uh, Tom Levis's Hopkins Center for Health Disparities, also based on this model. So the impact of this project is, has been huge and ongoing. Many hundreds of graduate students and postdocs trained directly by the PRBA faculty, of course. Uh, universities and colleges throughout the world employ faculty influenced by this program. Thousands more are indirectly influenced by the program through second generation scholars. I doubt there's been a more impactful research program conducted in social sciences at the University of Michigan in terms of transforming the workforce as well as how we conduct social science research. So I thank you and I thank everybody here for Michigan for my career, uh, for, for providing me a set of colleagues and collaborators that have lasted in fact my entire life. I am going to be retiring next year, but I'm proud to say that I have remained close to this, this, this family of researchers for my entire career. Uh, and I enjoy coming back every few years when they ask me, every week it seems. So thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. May I ask all the speakers to come forward, please? Our intent was to really have a wide variety of methodological approaches um, that people have used to do their work, not um, have the same theme, but rather to really expose you to the different types of things that people have been doing that have definitely represent this idea of innovation. So we want to open up the audience now. Um, any questions that you might have for any of our speakers? Yes, do we have our mics? We're on the, we need to pick it up for this 
about? Ah, there yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> right. So thank you for your presentations. I really appreciate the insight and your shared experiences and for coming back home. Um, one question I had for you, Dr. Nelbert, am I pronouncing it correctly? Um, for your audio or for your narratives that you had your participants, participants listen to, I was curious if you chose to do audio recordings versus them being read out loud. And also I was curious about the authenticity of the scripts themselves, if they were based off of actual lived experiences or more of a, uh, or if they were more uh, creative based on ideas of certain lived experiences. How did you come up with those scripts and how were they evaluated? How did you select what those scripts, how, how did they read? Um, can folks hear me okay? I think the mic is on. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, so the recordings were actually audio uh, recordings. So that's a, a fairly straightforward answer. Um, in terms of the development of the scripts, we um, consulted prior work that had used similar um, scenarios. So some of the work done by um, Dr. Harrell, um, as well as work done in other areas that's not race-based. Um, so Scott Vrana's work at um, VCU. Um, and then the piece that I think you're alluding to was, um, you know, our lab sort of looked at the scenarios and thought about kind of ecological validity and um, put all that together to come up with the, the scenarios. Questions? Fired. <laughs> But well, I'm going to ask Jennifer to go back to his closing statement where he talked about the relationship between the work that he's doing, because again, he's dealing with culture and he's dealing with the brain and he's taking a very innovative approach. But you also talk about a connection with discrimination. So could you say a little bit more about that? No. Uh, Is your mic on? Yes. Okay. Um, that's a extremely interesting question. And we have not done any research on discrimination per se, uh, but, uh, in this context, but we have used uh, survey research uh, with biomarkers to investigate uh, some potential influences of social status. And so let me share uh, one little finding we are getting uh, so if you ask, well, what we are getting is, is that uh, correlate of status appears to be very different depending on status is assessed in terms of objective markers. In this case, uh, say educational attainment uh, and occupational prestige. Uh, uh, just the higher status is good uh, for your health. Uh, for example, uh, cytokines, uh, inflammation, and cardiovascular problems, and stuff like this. And so if status is low, uh, you know, if you are, if you are, uh, uh, life is miserable, it, it's hard, fine. However, we are finding uh, one interesting thing, which is that subjective status sometimes has very mysterious effects and subjective status is extremely good for white American men. Uh, however, sub higher subjective status appears to have some cost as well, uh, because uh, maybe you may be beaten up because uh, you are presenting yourself as higher than you are supposed to be. Uh, you are deviating from where you are supposed to be, for example. And uh, that kind of effect we are finding among American women, white women in this case, and we haven't really looked into black people, uh, African-Americans, but probably something interesting to look into. And uh, especially among Japanese men, uh, higher status appears to be very damaging. Uh, I, I mean, again, it's very hard to draw any causal <laughs> Except in this case, uh, uh, you know, inflammation or cardiovascular problems may not necessarily increase your subjective status up or down. So I, I'd imagine that one uh, interpretation is that in Japanese context anyway, higher status, subjective status, seem to be inviting more stress. So this is just by way of illustrating this future possibility 
that uh, the status component, that the hierarchical aspects of culture or society uh, may have very nuanced effects depending on which segment of the society or general culture uh, there might be. So, uh, Thank you. Any other questions at this point? So I'll continue on my list. Uh, oh, well, see, he wanted to stop me. OK. Nope, there you go. Um, it was it was an extraordinary panel. Um, and I, um, I'd love to hear your dreams for social sciences and innovation and research methods for the next 15 years. So what would, what would Michigan 2030 look like in the, in the context of um, social science, whether it be through ISR or through our, our own home institutions? Well, <laughs> starting first here, since I'm closest to you, I'd actually like to see us figure out a way to influence policy. I mean, I, I think we have a lot of information but we don't seem to have a strategy for using that information to change the lives of people. I mean, we have some clues and we have some small projects, but I mean, I think that's been kind of the underlying theme of this gathering. You know, how can we use this information more effectively? So I'd like to see, you know, the, the people who come after us because, you know, I'm ending my career, uh, figure out how how best to do that. And we've had clues, you know, uh, about how you deliver the message in ways not to say it, in ways, you know, you should say it to, to speak to those uh, with the resources and the power to, to make a change, but I don't think we've done enough in that area. I'm not sure of my answer yet, but uh, were you thinking about in terms of innovation uh, in methodology or, or just more broader than than method. Okay. Can I? Jam yeah. In? Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, you know some of those comments came out, especially uh, from Melinda, from you. Uh, it is true that they used. It used to be the case that you needed a white uh, control group uh, in you know examining African Americans. In your case, in my case, uh, you know, I used to receive reviews from. You know, right. in general, hey, what does this mean? You really need a flight reference <laughs> group, right, to make se any sense out of this. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, there's some point. A comparison can provide some, uh, some you know, uh, uh, anchor in interpretation. But we have come a long way. Now, uh, social and behavioral scientists now seem to share this assumption that humans are very much uh, dependent on social context. And uh, from, uh, and I, I think no question asked about this point. Uh, in a way, that's very different from 30 years ago. You know, humans are conceptualized as autonomous being uh, that is very well packaged in a scalp or a body. And once you peel clothes and skin, everything identical. So what's the point of studying culture or race? If you, well, actually I was told that if you have any talent in psychology, well, why do you study anything like culture? <laughs> now, so yeah. things change, that's great. <laughs> However, if you go to natural biological science department, that's not necessarily the case. And, you know, one thing I heard from your talk, and, you know, that's something I try to express, which is that, well, surely humans are biological entity, but uh, humans are designed to be, uh, you know, kind of functional uh, after engaging in social, cultural environments. And I think uh, I like to see David, <laughs> take initiative in uh, the, basically educating uh, the rest of the people, especially in biological science field, the neuroscience, genetics included, uh, to uh, just, uh, you know, this convey fundamental, uh, what I see as a fundamental realization or finding from 
social sciences in the last half decade. No, half century. <laughs> yeah. It's a tough question, Jose. Um, but um, I think one of my hopes for this institution um, moving forward would be that we can continue to be self-reflexive about the ways that we go about the process of constructing knowledge, and in particular about the ways that we can have blinders on just in the ways that when we, when all the researchers were white, there were blinders, and there was embedded racism in the ways that people um, conducted their research, and opening the institution to different lived experiences, different perspectives, different knowledges, challenged that and moved us forward in the ways that we construct our knowledge. I would hope that we could continue down that path um, and really think about the um, the diversity and the multiple ways of know, knowing, the multiple epistemologies that are out there, I do feel like as uh, that institutions of higher education can become very closed off and sort of focused in on positivist science. Um, and I think we risk, there's a great risk in that process of closing ourselves off to other ways of knowing, things that can really enrich our ways of understanding the world. Um, and, in the, and that those are deeply embedded with inequalities, the theme of this um, panel, um, in terms of what kinds of knowledge, whose voices are valued, whose, whose, whose perspectives and lived experiences are considered legitimate knowledge. And I think that um, if we can continue to push that envelope, we will only end up with a, a, a richer science and a richer understanding of the world. And I think it will push us towards, I hope, greater equity. I'll just comment briefly. I think uh, my colleagues have given great answers on this. One thing I've been thinking about is, um, you know, we, we do better in terms of the range of populations that we study now. Um, so it's not just black or white, but there still are many groups um, for which we don't know a lot about. Um, and the, the population dynamics that are changing, thinking about the multiracial population, there's, there's still groups that we still just um, are still in the infancy. And so um, I'm hoping that, um, you know, 2030, whenever we're talking about um, the science is really reflective of um, the, the rapidly changing demographics and different um, um, groups that we're seeing come onto the fore. So I have uh, sort of two interrelated questions, but the first is for Enrique. Um, uh, and there's an article by an author in psychology named Lillenfeld uh, that I assume that you might be aware of based upon your research um, and where he sort of criticizes research on microaggressions uh, and essentially is not having an empirical or theoretical base, if, if I'm correct in that arg argument. And... Um, and I had some observations about the article, but first, could you give me some observations and, you know, from a psychological perspective, and then I can go on to my second question after that. I think my general reaction um, to, <laughs> let's see how I can answer this. Uh, <laughs> Diplomatically. <laughs> Diplomatically. Knowing that you're being recorded. <laughs> um, what I will say is that, I, um, Rob Sullers and I were talking about um, this work the other night. Um, I think there's a, I don't, maybe it's not a hidden agenda uh, <laughs> in terms of the reactions to the microaggressions literature. Um, I do think, and I don't know if this will surprise you, that um, we have work to do in the field of uh, microaggressions uh, I think some of the criticisms are important and we need to understand them and that there is room for um, improvement in terms of the work we do. So I don't think we should just take all of the critique and, and kind of throw it out. Um, I, I actually do think um, uh, some of the points made could be considered valid. Um, some I certainly do not. Um, but I think my, my gut reaction to it is... Um, that there's some other things operating in terms of the lens and the selection of the um, data that's presented to make arguments about um, the strength or weaknesses of the field um, that need to be um, 
addressed. I'll just leave it at that. So that relates to my second question, because the, the, the main problem I had with the argument, or his argument, was that he essentially said there's no real research been done in that area. However, it was very clear that he had not read any of the sociological, uh, any of the epidemiological, any of the social work. Uh, I can go on. He didn't cite David Williams. He said, uh, and let's get this straight. There's been research in sociology and epidemiology and public health for 20 years in this area. Okay, that none of that was cited. And so to say there's no empirical base is clearly flawed. But this gets to my second point. So the, the second point is that what I see in psychology, and especially sociology, is that uh, these are very, and as the years have gone by, very siloed um, disciplines. And so you see in that article a person who did not read outside of the field of psychology, did not cite anybody outside of the field of psychology. And what you see with the program for research on black Americans, we're very interdisciplinary, but none of us are working in a sociology or psychology department. All of us, Belinda's in psychiatry, uh, Cleo's in, in public health, I'm in social work, and that we're all trained in the disciplines. I don't think that's an accident. Uh, David Williams is in Afro-American studies in public health. I don't think that's an accident. I think that as the disciplines become more siloed, that instead of embracing team science, they're going more and more away from team science. So that's my bigger observation and sort of to the question that uh, Jose asked in terms of, of the future, where some fields tend to be going more towards the future of team science, other fields, especially sociology where I'm trained, it seems to be more and more siloed. So I'll get, get some general observations from the panel about that. Very brief because our time is really up. Well, but we were actually brief. discussing some of this at, at lunch today, right? That, that's very question. And I, I said that UCLA seems extremely siloed to me. Michigan has made strides that most of the universities I suspect they have not made. But you point out that even here, there are other kinds of silos. Well, I, I guess I'm a sociologist who also ran to public health, too, <laughs> which is a very multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary um, um, field. So, um, I, you know, to the extent that that is happening, I, I, think, it's, I think it's a real challenge for us. I mean, I, and I worry that even within the institution, when we talk interdisciplinarily, we we still need to push against those silos and be engaging. Um, I think a more engaged scholarship with people outside of academia is also really critical yes. for yes. us. You're right. Po politicians and, and, and others, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm really grappling with this um, right now. I've been in psychology for ten, about 10 years now, and um, because of the things I study, it's increasingly clear to me that um, psychologists <laughs> are missing, you know, don't have um, all the answers. Uh, what's interesting to me is that a lot of programs think they're becoming more um, interdisciplinary and you're seeing a cropping up of all these, oh, well, you have an opportunity to work with this and this, but um, I think we still have a long way to go um, to actually get there. Um, and I think there is inter-institutional variability. So, I trained here at Michigan, unfortunately, for whatever um, reasons, um, I never had the opportunity to interface with um, PRBN. So my training was, uh, you know, I worked with Rob um, as a psychologist. And as I've gone out into the world and tried to figure out how do I study these complex topics, I've had to, you know, kind of reach out and find other people. Um, so I think, um, how do we take what Michigan and PRBA and has done here and kind of <laughs> disseminate so that other folks are able to um, use the same model, um, I think would be beneficial. I, well, just very quickly. <laughs> I, 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 I was, um, I thought Michigan was great. Now, if this university has a real problem like this, uh, it would be a real problem. 
And uh, I think uh, w w at the same time, well, in my case, I would not be able to do a neuroscience extension of my early work if I had been in other institutions. Uh, I'm very sure maybe UCLA could be a potential uh, exception. Uh, but th th this university is very open uh, in many ways. But even then, you know, kind of problem is happening. I'm sure it's happening. That's a problem. But uh, just uh, the, on, the other, on the other side of the story is that if you are do, I'm a psychologist all the way through. And uh, if you want to persuade your psychology colleagues about the significance of race or significance of culture, in my case, you really have to be kind of narrow and go deep and, and uh, try to figure out the kind of uh, you know, jargons they are using and uh, kind of the discourse structures uh, you know, that define the field and so on. And you really have to sneak in <laughs> uh, and make some argument. Uh, you know, those things can matter. So uh, there's a very interesting task. You know, I think that's a, that this really presents a real challenge to all of us. That is, you really have to go deep in the discipline while at the same time, we need to bring in all the social, cultural, political, social, structural considerations, which most of my colleagues are entirely uh, ignorant, or maybe they are not interested in at all. So, so uphill battle um, in many ways, but I think that's a very important question. And for us grappling with issues of methodology, it's a very important one because I do think disciplines matter. I remember when I was in training, I was told that it's your job to do the good science. It's not your job to translate. I'm in public health because I want to translate. Yeah. Because people may not translate my work the way it should be translated. And certainly there's opportunities for influences because I also wanted to work with communities in terms of understanding um, what it is that we were doing and whether or not it had any relevance at all to communities. So I think this is a really important topic and it's not going to end here, but I am thrilled that we have our scholars with us today that have taken many different approaches to methodological issues that are going to be um, top notch. So I want to thank the panel for being here today, and I want to thank you for being here today as well. <laughs>